When it comes to birthright citizenship, we live in troubled times. Since the summer of 2018, at least since the summer of 2018, it's been hard to miss how um, this bedrock of our system of national belonging, birthright citizenship, has been subject to criticism, rethinking, um, outright assault. Um, some of you may have seen the summer 2018 op-ed in the Washington Post, a former White House operative who promised that birthright uh, citizenship was destined for history's dustbin. Um, the president in October that year confirmed in an interview with Axios, um, he suggested that he would do away with birthright uh, by an executive order. We're waiting. But the fallout of this um, hot and um, highly situated rhetoric um, is all around us. Um, maybe you remember, things come so quickly, you might not. Um, there was that moment when pundits doubted that Kamala Harris, the daughter of unnaturalized immigrants when she was born in Oakland, California, um, they doubted that she was a natural born citizen of the US. Um, perhaps she was someone ineligible to hold office the office of the president. U.S. Attorney uh, General William Barr, um, the nation's highest lawyer, on the eve of assuming his office uh, during a congressional hearing when asked about his views on birthright citizenship, he said, I have none. Wow. Border officials doubt the veracity of the birth certificates held by Latino citizens in Texas. They detain U.S. citizens now for weeks until their citizenship is confirmed. New rules narrow birthright, no longer guaranteeing, for example, that the children born to US military and diplomatic personnel overseas are citizens by birth. Our friends, our classmates, and many more among us, our neighbors, our coworkers, carry reams of documents in their pockets and in their bags they also carry lawyers' phone numbers today when they travel domestically, even when they travel locally, wary that they may be the next birthright citizen whose right to remain in the US will be questioned. It turns out we don't have to imagine a nation, what this nation might be like without the protections that birthright accords. We don't have to imagine it because our uh, in our not so distant future, in our, uh, par pardon me, our not so distant past, and perhaps our not so distant future, um, but in the past was a period during which without birthright, a community of Americans were subjected to a sort of persistent terror, not unlike that which we see unfolding around us today. The history how we, of how we got to birthright, the story that I'll tell this afternoon, is a window into our own times before the Civil War, before emancipation, before the 14th Amendment set the birthright principle into our Constitution, free black Americans, many of them formerly enslaved people, lived at risk, subject to political whims, and without clear recourse, when some other Americans declared that this was a white man's republic, one with no future for black people. They faced persistent threats of removal, deportation in today's parlance. Lawmakers failed them, left them to fend for themselves, and then remarkably become the architects of a new constitution, bequeathing to all of us the bedrock that is birthright. It's a hard history, but it's also, for me, an inspiring one. When I learned how black Americans struggled against their exclusion, their erasure, and near expulsion from the United States, when I learned how they struggled and insisted upon their right to remain here and to belong, to come and go, and to be Americans, it was a story I knew I wanted to, to tell. We're going to have a guide through our conversation this afternoon, um, a man named George Hackett. This is the um, uh, grave marker. Um, Hackett is buried today just north of Baltimore City in a place called Laurel Cemetery. And Hackett is our guide um, as someone who lived um, the arc of the story, this first chapter in the history of birthright citizenship. He's born in 1807 and lives until 1870. 
um, we might compare him, a sort of peer to Frederick Douglass, a little older than Douglass, who was born probably in 1818 and lived till 1895. Hackett is born in Baltimore City in Maryland. Um, he's born to uh, free black parents, free himself. Um, but it is a moment in which African Americans in Baltimore and in Maryland generally are being disenfranchised. It's part of the history we don't always recall that African American men after the revolution voted in the state of Maryland until 1802 when lawmakers undertook to rewrite the Constitution and insert the word white as a voting qualification. Hackett lived to the eve of the 15th Amendment that remarkable effort to guarantee to African-American men, once again, the right to vote. And the thrust of his vision, that the vision that animates his life and his politics and his activism, was probably most forcefully put uh, by one of his peers, um, the abolitionist and journalist, um, prophetic thinker, Martin Delaney, who wrote in 1852, we are Americans having birthright citizenship. Our common country is the United States. Here we were born, here raised and educated. Here are the scenes of childhood, the pleasant associations of our school going days, the loved enjoyments of our domestic fireside, domestic and fireside relations, and the sacred graves of our departed fathers and mothers. We are Americans by virtue of having a birthright citizenship natural claims upon the country, claims common to all others of our fellow citizens, natural rights, which may by unjust laws be obstructed, but never can be annulled. But I'm ahead of myself a little bit. Many decades before Delaney penned those words, as early as the 1820s, George Hackett and men like him were asking this question. Who were they before the law? Who were they before the Constitution? That is where they looked. They began with constitutions, um, and this courted them a sort of informal but important study of law through the texts in conference deliberations and in the pages of their newspapers. George's first education came at home, even before he was an adult. Around the Hackett family table, he learned about institution building. His father was a deacon in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, who had a hand not only in the brick and mortar expression of that institution, but also was responsible for the incorporation of the AME Church, um, completing the sort of formal texts, documents that established the church um, and its right to um, practice its faith in a city like Baltimore. Charles Hackett, George's father, was an agent for Freedom's Journal, the very first African-American newspaper published in New York City, but circulating in Baltimore City by Hackett, who received the packet and then distributed it in the city's streets. Charles Hackett helped build schools, freed an enslaved minister, built a life in a community of meaning. Um, his son watched and learned. They both knew that few believed them to be citizens, but they weren't discouraged. Now, the US Constitution offered, I would say, only a small bit of insight into the puzzle that the Hackett's faced. It was mostly silent about the question of who is a citizen or what the rights of citizens might be. Um, the Constitution talks about enslaved people, free people, Native Americans. It guarantees privileges and immunities to citizens. It requires this, the president be a natural born citizen, a senator, a citizen for nine years. But there's really no explication of what, what makes one a citizen of the United States. And black Americans pick up on this room, this space, this ambiguity, um, this silence even in the Constitution. And it is the beginning, the beginning of an argument that they too, like American presidents, are natural born citizens. They look also at their state constitutions, and for the Hackett, that's the Constitution of the State of Maryland, 
And there, there is even more silence, more room for doubt, for ambiguity, and for possibility for black Americans. The word citizen doesn't appear in the Maryland state constitution. Um, and so men like the Hackett's um, take that opportunity again to build a case. Now you might ask why citizenship? Um, uh, freedom, um, political rights, why citizenship? Uh, why is this what they land on? And there are two pressures that are facing um, men like the Hackett's and their families and their communities in the early decades of the 19th century. The first is a movement we call colonization. Colonization is a, a sort of curious um, anti-slavery movement. Um, colonizationists since the 18th century um, have worked pursuant to the notion that um, the US is a white man's country, um, that there is no future for black Americans as free people and as full members of the body politic. And as a consequence, by the 18 teens, colonizationists are organizing, raising funds, lobbying in Congress and in state legislatures, and sometimes gently and sometimes not so gently, um, urging former slaves, free people of color, to leave the United States. And this is a pressure on people like the Hackett's for whom Baltimore is the only home they've known. A companion to colonization is what we come to call black laws. And these are usually state level laws that regulate the everyday nature of life for former slaves. Where one can work, how one worships, whether one can own property. Can you travel? Can you own a gun or a dog? Free African Americans are subject to an ambitious spate of legislation, all of which goes to regulating these sorts of everyday questions. And what they come to understand is that, yes, state lawmakers are interested in um, controlling um, the everyday dynamics of a city like Baltimore, but really what black laws are intended to do is to pressure people to make life so uncomfortable, untenable, um, that they will, in fact, succumb to the enticements of colonization and, in essence, self-deport from the United States. Now, the Hackett's ask, so are such things constitutional? Is it, in fact, constitutional for state to distinguish between black and white uh, residents, citizens, um, as the black laws do? And they are not alone. Um, by the 1820s, um, highly placed lawmakers, members of Congress, the Senate and House alike, are also um, puzzling over, um, confounded by, and attempting to work through this question, how to situate former slaves before the Constitution. In 1821, the state of Missouri, for example, is seeking admission to the United States. Missouri proposes a Constitution, and Congress reviews it. Very straightforward. But members of Congress stumble and, in fact, are stopped in their tracks when they recognize that the state, the proposed state constitution, includes a provision that would outright ban the entry of free people of color into the new state of Missouri. Is that constitutional? Is that a violation of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is understood to guarantee equality to all citizens before the law? Well, that depends on whether or not you think, in fact, free African Americans are citizens. And we can come back, as we do, to the pages of the Annals of Congress and discover that these debates stretch out over days, they stretch out over weeks. Positions run a gamut from the view that every person in the United States, born in the United States, is a citizen, including men of color, um, to the view that color is an absolute bar to citizenship. Hence, the Privileges and Immunities Clause has no application. And the most interesting for, thing for me about this debate, in addition to the fact that it turns out um, there is already a learned and a deep reflection about this question that haunts the Hackett's life, what really strikes me is that Congress can't figure it out can't figure it out, can't arrive at a clear um, 
uh, conclusion. And so it does two things. On the one hand, it says to Missouri, you can leave this troubling or ambiguous provision in your constitution. However, Missouri, we admonish you, and I never know what it means to admonish um, when it comes from Congress, but okay. Congress admonishes the state not to violate the rights of citizens, including citizens of color. Hmm? Not a lot of guidance. Um, and this um, state of thinking, this muddled state of affairs comes to be the ordinary course in the lives of people like the Hackett's. The inability, the incapacity, the unwillingness of lawmakers to not only discern the question, but then to answer it in a way that certainly would give this family, their community, and the hundreds of thousands others of them, um, like them, um, some clarity about where they stand. There is no good answer. Now George um, comes of age, he marries in 1828, the daughter of a family friend. It's a really grand affair and there's a iteration of it in the Baltimore Sun, what the women wore, what people ate and drank. It's a, it was really um, a society event. He begins working first as a waiter. He operates a livery stable for a while. Um, we begin to glimpse his entrepreneurial sensibilities. He experiences a number of setbacks. Um, his stable is washed out by a flood. The horses, um, many of them are killed and um, he has to fold up um, the livery stable business. His first born child, a son, a namesake, uh, George, uh, dies in infancy. And Hackett does, makes a choice um, that is quite common for free men of color in a city like Baltimore, um, he goes to sea. He joins the crew of the USS Constitution. And if I have even one naval history buff in the room, I'm getting a nod. Um, old Ironsides, um, having made its reputation um, during the um, years uh, after the American Revolution, um, now in service, um, in getting ready to embark on a Pacific tour, um, George signs on as the steward to the fleet's commander, Alexander Claxton, um, and he will now spend many, many months at sea. Um, what happens? A couple of things. It is a kind of education, an important education for a free man of color for whom formal opportunities for learning are still very limited. Um, the uh, Constitution will visit um, ports throughout the Americas, Havana and Cuba, Veracruz and Mexico, um, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It'll run around the Horn and up the West Coast, up and down the West Coast of South America, um, uh, policing um, the Pacific. Um, all throughout this, Hackett finds himself in port cities where the kinds of questions that he is facing, who are we before the law, what sort of laws apply to us, are they legitimate or not? These are questions that are being asked throughout all the cities of the Americas. All of these cities are in that long and tortured transition from slavery to freedom, growing free people of color communities in all these cities, um, and each has its own sort of awkward set of answers. It turns out the questions he's asking in Baltimore are not merely local, um, they are hardly parochial, um, they are at the core of the future of the Americas. Now, George does more um, than labor aboard the Constitution, um, in a sense. His presence and the presence of other black sailors um, all um, open up a set of questions about um, who free men of color are, especially within um, this maritime culture. Now, um, and it turns out once again that um, law, if law and its texts might um, define or resolve or establish who black sailors could be, um, it doesn't do a very good job. 
Men like Hackett carry what are called Seaman's Protection Certificates in the early 19th century. These are um, uh, federal issued documents that swear to their status as US citizens. Sailors black and white carry them in an effort to resist impressment that has forced service into foreign navies, particularly the British are notorious um, for impressing uh, US sailors. Um, Hackett and men like him would have carried these government issued documents that swore to their status as citizens. And at the very same time, had Hackett, for example, arrived in the port of Charleston in South Carolina, he either would have been detained aboard the Constitution, forbidden from entering the port of Charleston, or he would have been permitted to enter the port only to spend his time ashore in a jail. Is this constitutional? Can the state of South Carolina distinguish between sailors black and white? Are black sailors entitled to the equal protection of the laws through the Privileges and Immunities Clause? We can't say one way or the other because both things are true in this period and this is this muddled state of affairs. Now there's one more thing that happens aboard the Constitution that I didn't anticipate till I spent time with the logbooks and really began to understand the day-to-day -day life um, in a naval flotilla. And it turns out that, um, well, first off, this part won't surprise you, that over the months and years um, that this squadron travels, um, there are infractions, big and small, um, many of them committed when sailors are in port and are granted 24 or 48 hours of leave. I won't describe it for you. I think you get the picture. Um, there's a lot of hijinks that goes on. And um, at the same time, um, there are um, grand questions about um, diplomatic relations um, and the relationship of higher placed seamen um, to the navies of um, host nations like Brazil. And when infractions are charged, um, the Commodore's quarters turn into basically a courthouse. Um, he becomes the, um, uh, the judge. Um, he convenes the prosecutors. He convenes the defense lawyers out of his team of officers. And George observes up close um, the workings of a legal culture, a sophisticated one, um, and one that takes on this extraordinary range of infractions. And there are two things in particular that I imagine he observed that were of consequence, that really fueled his thinking and rethinking about the legal culture of Baltimore. The first was that unlike in Maryland where Black men were barred from testifying against the interests of white people. In the Navy, black sailors testified against the interests of white sailors regularly. If they had evidence, if they had been a witness, frankly, even if they had an opinion, um, it was ordinary that they would be called and they would give testimony and have a part in convicting uh, white sailors and black sailors um, of offenses they had a kind of legal standing that was distinct from Baltimore City. The other thing is that when sailors, black and white, were convicted of offenses, in the Navy, they were subject to flogging, equal opportunity flogging aboard the Constitution, if you will. But this contrasts to what George knew about Baltimore, which is that by the 1830s, only black offenders were subject to flogging. Flogging was a punishment that was so closely associated with the degraded status of slave that white men were excused. They were punished in other ways, we can be sure. But flogging um, had an equal opportunity quality aboard the Constitution. And George is thus not only getting an education, I think he's getting a critical education about what he will encounter in Baltimore. Commander Claxton dies um, uh, in, during the Pacific tour and George's time aboard the Constitution ends. He hops a 
uh, a whaler, the Anne, out of Nantucket to make his way home. He arrives in Nantucket in 1841. Um, it is the hotbed of radical abolitionism. And Frederick Douglass had just a couple of weeks before given his very first public political speech on the subject of anti-slavery there in Nantucket. It is an extraordinary place to find yourself as a free man of color. Um, I don't know what he does there, um, but he winds up doing something that for me is remarkable, which is that he doesn't stay. He doesn't take advantage, he doesn't fold himself in, he doesn't become part of this burgeoning community of radical abolitionism with all its potential and possibility. Instead, he makes his way back home to Baltimore City. The first time I find him back in Baltimore, he's back at, um, uh, he's back in the local courthouse. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but he um, becomes a property owner. He buys a lot and a small house. Um, he begins to build a business. He follows in his father's footsteps and becomes a deacon in the AME church. Um, and then I find him in the courthouse. It's the most ordinary of encounters. He gets into a kind of dust up with a, a white man um, named John Pitt. What happened between them, I can't really say. But I do know what George did after the encounter, which is that he marched himself over, the house, over to the courthouse. He swore out a complaint, waited until the sheriffs brought Pitt in. He took the stand and testified against Pitt, was a witness against this white man who had assaulted him, and he won and took home a dollar which was a pretty typical fine in these kinds of cases. But I want you to hear the way in which George, upon returning to Baltimore, is really pressing on and challenging the norms, the conventions, the rules, the black laws that would say he can never testify against Pitt. It turns out in Baltimore City, if he presses the question, he can. Now, he's an elder and then deacon in the AME church. Um, and here, he is a steward for this collective property, some of the only property owned by the black community in the city of Baltimore. And we find him in the courthouse regularly, protecting the property of the church from speculators, from predatory lenders, um, and sometimes even one faction of the leadership from the other. Some of you know what I mean. This goes on in churches. But Hackett is again in the courthouse, not only um, evidencing his legal savvy, right, his acumen about how law works, about how courthouse works, but again, testifying against the interests of these white creditors in particular and defending this church property, this embodiment of belonging in Baltimore. Now, Maryland lawmakers, um, not only in Baltimore, but throughout the state, are increasingly aware of people like George Hackett. Um, there's one commentator who remarks, you know, that um, white Marylanders are really um, uh, unsettled because free people of color seem to be um, carrying themselves um, in the city of Baltimore as if they were people with rights. Um, and um, as a consequence, in 1851, um, when the state of Maryland goes to rewrite its constitution um, wholesale for the first time since 1776, um, one of the big questions before the Constitutional Convention is this problem of settling and securing and reigning in free people of color, clarifying their status, fixing it, so that they stay um, within their bounds. There's a debate. Are they denizens? Are they aliens? Are they freemen? Are they citizens? Are they simply human beings with human rights? All of this is on the table. Once again, like three decades before in the Missouri debates in Congress, learned, far-ranging, spirited, um, and they are unable 
to resolve the question. They even create a committee um, that goes off on its own to write a series of resolutions that would address this question and be inserted into the Constitution. And all the resolutions fail. They can't figure it out. And these high lawmakers, these are the best legal minds of the state of Maryland, punt to the state legislature and simply include a brief clause that says, you figure it out. House of Delegates, you figure it out. And this is the state of citizenship that has um, haunted George, right, for all of these years. Now, th this last chapter in this murky saga um, is probably the one that is known best um, uh, to a group like this, and it is the era of the 1850s now, um, and the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford, is going to be presented with this question um, that Hackett has been chewing on and wrestling with, that neither Congress um, nor a state constitutional convention could resolve. Justice Roger Bertani takes the occasion of the Dred Scott case, a freedom suit brought by an enslaved man, to reach, some would say overreach, but reach nonetheless, to clarify who Tawny thinks free people of color are. And if you know anything about Dred Scott, you know that Justice Tawny concludes that no black person, be they free or enslaved, can be a citizen of the United States. And for a long time, we took this as the last word, but I'm here to tell you that it's not. And I think I'm, no, I think I'm good. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's not, because the next year, in 1858, Another case, Hughes versus Jackson, comes to not the US Supreme Court, but the Court of Appeals of the State of Maryland, which is the high court in the state. Hughes versus Jackson is a dispute between two free men of color on Maryland's eastern shore. One has kidnapped and enslaved the children of the other. And when the kidnapper loses and is fined $750, at the trial level, he appeals to the high court. And what does he say? He says, wait a minute, judge. This guy, Samuel Jackson, who sued me, he can't sue me. Free people of color have no standing in courts. Don't you know what Justice Tawney said? And don't you think that in Maryland we should import right, the logic of Justice Tawney? Now, this is a lawyer's argument. I just want to, I want to confess that, right? It, it's against the interest, seemingly, of a free man of color to argue he has no right to sue. But $750 is a lot of money. And they're prepared to make this argument. And what does the court say? What does the High Court of Maryland say? It is this. No thank you to Dred Scott. No. In the state of Maryland, free people of color must have the right to sue and be sued to protect their persons and their property. Now why? Why would a high court in Maryland say such a thing? Why would it reject a Dred Scott? Two important reasons. Chief Justice John Carroll Legrand says first and foremost, there are 75,000 free people of color in the state of Maryland. They are workers. How do we expect free people to labor if they don't have the ability to come into a local courthouse and to protect their persons and their property, the fruits of their wages. As long as free people of color are among us, they must have the ability to sue and be sued, to testify, right? All of those rights. The second thing Legrand says is, you know, those 75,000 people, if I conclude that they have no rights, that they have no right to come into this courthouse and to protect their persons and property, I will, in one fell swoop, create 75,000 outlaws in the state of Maryland. Right? These are still people who are going to have disputes, and now they're going to resolve them out on the dirt road, in the yard, um, in the city streets. And that is not a formula for prosperity or social order in a state like Maryland. We must accord free people of color these civil rights as long as they are among us. 
And so here, we get a strong sense of, once again, the way in which a man like Hackett finds himself um, in an unclear, unresolved, um, murky, and troubling circumstance. Who is he before the Constitution? Well, I guess it depends. The last time Hackett is in the courthouse in the 1850s is 1859. Um, he's had a cold business, he's gone bankrupt, and he shows up to ap apply for insolvency and to have his debts forgiven. It's a very ordinary course for um, small entrepreneurs in a city like Baltimore, black and white, in this period. But in this last moment, um, what I want us to um, make note of is that once again, he's able to testify against the interests of white creditors um, who oppose and object to the extinguishment of his debts. He is able to bring on a African-American man, a friend, as a trustee uh, who serves as an officer of the court and handles the paperwork and the ordering of debts and assets for the court um, during the bankruptcy proceeding. These are not the kinds of roles that the black laws anticipate for free men of color, and yet Hackett and men like him are coming into this local courthouse and they are succeeding they are succeeding in really um, reaching beyond the formal boundaries. The politics of um, oh, there we go. The politics of 1859 um, probably catch Hackett somewhat unaware. John Brown's raid in Harper Ferry really turns up the temperature in southern state legislatures, and a new spate of black laws are proposed in Annapolis, the state capital. They are as draconian as any that free people of color have faced in all these decades. Now, colonization um, is proposed to be not a voluntary um, uh, enterprise, but a mandatory one. And it is proposed that the state pass a law that would require free people of color either to leave the state and their property behind or submit to what is referred to as re-enslavement. It's a misnomer. They've never been enslaved. At least Hackett certainly has not. But to submit to becoming enslaved. Hackett gets whiff of this, and he begins to organize in Baltimore City, first with a petition drive where he collects hundreds of signatures from black and white citizens of Baltimore in opposition to this legislation, the Jacobs Bill, as it's called. He then takes himself to Annapolis. We might call this lobbying. Um, though this is not the term we had in the 19th century, he shows up in the State House, presents himself at the door of the House of Delegates. Proceedings pretty much stop in their tracks. It might be um, a safe bet that Hackett is the first person of color to step into the chamber who wasn't there in uh, some sort of domestic capacity. Um, and he confronts Curtis Jacobs. Um, Jacobs is the proponent of this bill that proposes to um, re-enslave our free Negro population. Um, here, um, Jacobs' view is that um, there is in no sense that the, any law in Maryland confers citizenship. Um, the government was made exclusively um, for the benefit of the white population. And Hackett will confront him and um, indicate he is speaking on behalf of those 75,000 free people of color in the state and make his case that in fact they are citizens of the state of Maryland and citizens of the United States. And he will win. Which is to say the Jacobs Bill um, is defeated um, and we come into the era of the Civil War um, with free people of color in Maryland um, having escaped this latest round of draconian legislation. Not so, for example, in the state of Virginia, where re-enslavement will become the order of the day um, in this very same moment. It's a powerful, it's a powerful scene. Um, some people tell it um, that Jacobs and Hackett, um, before they actually talk it out, 
uh, duke it out on the on the lawn of the courthouse. I'm not uh, of the state house. I'm not really sure it's true, but but somebody wrote it down, and I thought it made for a makes a great scene for a movie, maybe. Um, but it's to say um, George Hackett is not only sort of come out of the local politics and legal culture of Baltimore through this episode. Um, he has. Um, very directly taken on state lawmakers around this um, critical question of citizenship. For a long time, I think, when we told the story of citizenship, we started with Dred Scott and we uh, fast forwarded right to the Civil War. Um, Attorney General uh, Edward Bates in 1862 will issue an opinion um, contrary to all that's come before him and it. Um, he will conclude that free people of color are citizens of the United States. Um, this will be affirmed um, and become law in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And in 1868, um, the 14th Amendment will constitutionalize this birthright citizenship provision and principle that Hackett had advocated for, that Martin Delaney had eloquently described, um, and that had um, implicitly um, helped to defeat the Jacobs Bill um, back in Annapolis. But if you've gotten any sense of George Hackett and who Hackett was, um, he was someone who really didn't wait. Didn't wait for Bates, didn't wait for Congress, um, didn't wait for the states to ratify the 14th Amendment. Um, back in Baltimore City, he was um, very quickly um, hard at work on, again, evidencing his strong sense that he and others like him were citizens. And so we find him very um, quickly after the war, um, for example, joining the Republican Party and being a passionate and effective advocate for the right of African American men to vote in the state of Maryland. We find him an advocate for education. Um, throughout all his years, um, Hackett had paid school taxes in Baltimore City, even as his children were barred from that city's public schools. One of his first projects is um, to return to the city council and to effectively and successfully advocate for the establishment of black public schools. His nickname um, was um, Captain, and on that, uh, on that grave marker, he's referred to as Captain. It took me a long time to figure out what that was, other than a mark of respect and affection. Um, well, it turned out um, George was a captain of what was called the Butler Guard, um, the very first African-American-led, um, African-American um, comprised um, militia in the state of Maryland and the city of Baltimore. And you could find him and his compatriots um, in their uniforms, with their firearms, um, occupying and marching through the streets of Baltimore, um, this profound, visible, unequivocal claim um, to a kind of citizenship that had always been at the core of Hackett's identity. He didn't wait for Washington. In fact, what he did was wait for Washington to catch up. So our story ends um, uh, in 1869 and 70. Um, Hackett will be um, one of the first to um, uh, take part, from Baltimore to take part in a um, national, um, what was called a colored convention in 1869 in Washington, D.C. And from that convention, um, one that debated all the political and legal questions of the day facing former slaves, um, he would be among a delegation that would break off from the convention and um, call upon um, the newly elected U.S. President, um, Ulysses Grant, um, he would lobby Grant um, and other lawmakers on that day um, for what would become the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, he still is working on the full meaning of citizenship. Um, it is, um, sadly, um, the end of his life, and um, he will not live long enough to see the 15th Amendment that he had so effectively lobbied for um, ratified. 
Um, but this picture, um, this scene, um, is indeed of Baltimore City um, in front of that local courthouse where we know George Hackett returned again and again and again during his lifetime in an effort to construct himself and others like him as a citizen. Um, this is where the national celebration of the ratification of the 15th Amendment convenes um, in the shadow of that very same courthouse. Um, Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, um, many of the dignitaries and peers to Hackett are all here. Um, and if you're at all like me and allow yourself um, dreams and imaginings in addition um, to archives and hard facts, um, you would probably agree um, that even as he was not here in body, um, Hackett was certainly here in spirit, um, very, very pleased to see um, his aspirations um, so made manifest. This story, um, we might say ends here um, in this awkward monument to Hackett. It's the only one to him. Um, in a neglected cemetery um, in uh, Baltimore County. Uh, there's an obelisk that's tip top, toppled over um, in the spring. You can't even quite find this. It's overgrown with ivy and weeds. Um, and that might be an apt commentary on this early history of African Americans and citizenship. Um, obscured, neglected, overlooked. Um, I wonder if Hackett would have us come in and clean up this scene, right? Clear the brush, restore the obelisk, and the other headstones that surround his own grave marker, um, a tribute to this generation, this first generation who struggled um, so deliberately under um, under um, circumstances of um, hostility and neglect and more. Um, but I suspect, if I know anything about Hackett, um, he'd enjoy the tribute. Um, I think he, um, the moniker ca Captain was probably one that he, um, he would have appreciated and enjoyed. Um, but I think he'd also um, urge us not to linger too long here on the past. Um, I think he'd urge us um, to pause only briefly um, and instead would call us to um, the unfinished business in our own time. Um, the challenge of human rights, um, the proportions of which um, we are only beginning to glimpse standing here in the fall of 2019. Um, I think he'd tell us there was work to do, um, work to do um, justice to be extracted from places high, but also places low, um, that we need to be um, creative and improvisational, and we need to be dogged, um, whether we're standing in our local courthouse or before the US Supreme Court. Um, so I hope with me um, you appreciate his example um, and his admonition that we um, get back to work. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you for that provocative um, talk because I think you all can probably agree there was not only a mixture of kind of captivating narration but also kind of legal history uh, that I think, and then the, your ending, the monument, kind of who do, we, um, who do we honor and who have we either silenced or disavowed. And so um, we have about 15 minutes for uh, question and answer. And so there will be a, um, a microphone floating around and it's important that you ask your question into the microphone because we're taping it and so it'll make sure that the quality is, um, uh, is, is uh, such that those who are viewing can actually uh, listen to it. So uh, the mic is in the back and if you, uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Jones to kind of call on whomever uh, has questions and then um, we'll circulate the mic around. Questions or comments? I think you're on the left. Hi. Yes, oh, uh, 
yeah, good, great memory. Um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering about, so, you know, you choose to profile, um, in your talk at least, and also I'm assuming your book, an individual. What made, or how do you think that you can kind of transfer that story of one person into a more communal understanding of a history that I'm sure affected not only Hackett, but numerous other black men? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and you give me the opportunity to point out that um, when I begin this work, um, I begin in the archives of Baltimore City because I know it's the home to the largest community of free people of color um, before the Civil War. And so um, this city, which is in between North and South and in between slavery and freedom um, with a gateway to the Atlantic world. Um, I am interested in all 25,000 of those folks. And um, it turns out, I think, for the purposes of a talk, um, having an individual is um, a great way to help us kind of stay with the story. Um, but in the larger book, um, there are many, many figures like Hackett, um, alongside Hackett, um, whether they are other uh, insolvency applicants or um, permit seekers for dogs and guns or um, bringing criminal complaints or part of that very large black Methodist community where he's a leader, um, he really stands in for the purposes of our conversation this afternoon for many, many people in the book itself. Um, and. And at the same time, there's no question that um, he becomes exceptional for me because I keep bumping into him again and again. I didn't go looking for him. Um, he just kept coming to me in the archive. Um, and um, it was a long time before I realized that um, he had this long and remarkable life and that he indeed was a leader, right, and was setting the agenda for um, many people who were sort of part of his um, larger world. Um, so I hope I succeed to some degree in the book in showing you the ways in which um, his story is a companion to many other stories in Baltimore City. Um, and it's also true that there are people um, in the city, 25,000 is a big number um, in the 19th century. Um, there are many people whom I cannot tell you much about. I see them, I glimpse them in the pages of a clerk's docket book. Um, or on um, uh, scribbled on a permit application or a court order, um, and I never see them again. And I think this is also part of the story of Baltimore and of the courthouse, which is to say it's a transient place. Right? Frederick Douglass comes through, um, but Douglass, like many, is a fugitive who passes through. Um, there are many people drawn further north for the sorts of liberty and security and opportunities that it provides and won't stay on the way Hackett does, and at the same time, I think even for those more transient folks, the courthouse from time to time is, if not a haven, it's a strategy. Um, particularly, um, I was struck by how many um, bankruptcy or insolvency petitions there are brought by free people of color um, that are denied or declined by the court because the applicant never returns. And I can't say for sure, but my working sense of that, those applications is that, my strong working sense is that, um, in fact, people are using insolvency, you know, to kind of avert a crisis for a moment, and then probably they move on, right, to Philadelphia or to New York, um, or maybe even south to Norfolk or Charleston, um, rather than hang around and sort of face the, the full-scale insolvency proceeding that they've initiated. So some people are using the courthouse in these passing and really everyday ways. Um, Hackett is... Um, stuck with me, and um, some people may know I'm an early work on a, um, a graphic biography of Hackett. Um, so partly I'm taking advantage of you to tell his story and see what parts stick and what parts are interesting to you. Um, it's a young person's biography, so um, I'm very interested in um, the way people respond to his story and what parts of his story are compelling. Um, because I'd like to um, have a graphic telling of his life as a way of bringing some of this history of Hackett, of the politics and law of his life, um, to younger readers in Baltimore. So that's what I'm working on these days. So thanks for that. Um, 
I was sort of interested, you mentioned that Maryland higher court, which used almost an economic argument for uh, retaining like certain rights for free blacks at the time. And I can't help but sort of see a parallel to that and the current sort of pool of undocumented labor in the United States. And I was wondering your thoughts on whether or not that argument is an addition or a welcome addition to sort of one based in like morality or, or sort of uh, human rights or whether or not it detracts from that. Oh, I love the way you phrased that question um, because um, my first answer might have been, um, well, it's a good argument because it works, right? And that's part of this story um, is that um, there are very few characters in this story who are political philosophers, um, you know, who are um, coming to this question um, as an intellectual or academic um, matter. Um, nearly everyone in this story is always thinking about citizenship um, and the rights of free people of color in relationship to real material circumstances and crises. Um, and it's part of what makes it such a murky, uneven, um, unsatisfying story. Um, the lawmakers I write about are not philosophers. They are really practical people um, trying to, in a very um, immediate way, um, navigate something very thorny. But your question was a little different, right? Which is, does that undercut somehow? Um, and I would say um, it's hard for me to extract those arguments or, or, or um, uh, disaggregate them from one another. Um, and precisely because it's not only in this moment, but I think um, we could tell the entire history of US citizenship as one um, arrived at and our ideas and our principles and our laws about citizenship as having been arrived at never by learned political reflection and philosophical insight and the study of long history, never. Um, but always our approach to citizenship has been circumstantial. Um, if you will, the next chapter in the story is um, that after the Civil War and the case of um, Chinese Americans, immigrants and Chinese Americans um, in the latter half of the 19th century. There were very few political philosophers weighing in on the status and the citizenship status of um, Chinese American children born in the United States, but there is a rousing debate that is animated by racism, by xenophobia, and more, anxiety about labor, and more. Um, and that is our way, I would say. And so um, here we are, and if there's a lesson, and we talked about this earlier, Brendan, I, I, I'm not sure that there's a direct lesson to be drawn, but if there's a lesson, um, it is that um, our tradition about this is, um, as the men and women in my story did, you know, you throw all the arguments at the wall and you see what sticks, right? Because what you're trying to do is extract yourself, right, from a real material and humanitarian crisis um, and the luxury of um, highly uh, wrought political philosophy um, just isn't there. And I think that's partly where we are, right, at that really messy space between law and politics um, that means everything is on the table. I don't think it's enough in this moment in our own time to resort to or to lean on um, or to call upon um, the birthright principle as it was set in place in 1868 and to believe that that resolves the chaos that is happening here. We have to make a new argument about what we think citizenship is. And if we think birthright is the way to go, we need to say why that is in the 21st century and not only in the 19th century. Yeah, thank you. I see a hand in the back. Thank you. Um, I had a you, you described this as an interval when the, when the law is muddled, when it's trying to sort itself out and, and um, part of it. But then it, it struck me as interesting that that, um, that category of the citizen is quite thinly developed even in the Constitution before. Um, and, and part of the Part of the moral of the story, as you told it, was the suggestion that in a way the law is never more forceful than when it's indeterminate in this. It is exactly when it's muddled that, that 
one is compelled to internalize it when it becomes, when, as you say, when it haunts and when it, um, and so I'm wondering whether it's not coincidental that it's around the category of the citizen that you have these ambiguities. And, and in a way, the, the, something like the Dred Scott, the, you know, the mistake of the Dred Scott is precisely that it's clarifying, which means it forces the, law, forces the law's own hand or, um, but anyway, that's, that was a... Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, because it's something I thought about a lot. Um, and um, from my vantage point, um, there is a, a very um, pronounced way in which um, this story turns out to be, for me, an indictment of legal culture in the antebellum United States. And I say that because our scholarly observations aside, lawmakers in this story pride themselves. They rationalize and justify their own value, unique value, right? They um, win the support for the um, growth, the expansion, right, of a robust and sophisticated legal culture in these very decades, they do all of that rooted in the claim that what law offers to us are two things. Predictability, right? So law is supposed to tell us who we are and who we will be. That is law's pride. Right? That is why law is different than politics, which is changeable right? and subject to you know, the vagaries of any given moment. Law is supposed to give us predictability and it's supposed to give us finality. It is not intended in its most prideful sense of itself to leave us in limbo, to leave us uncertain to leave us vulnerable. If we're vulnerable, law should tell us that we're vulnerable right? and, and declare it so. Right, um, and so for me, um, it is one of the surprises of this book. I thought I was going to write a book. You know what I mean? I thought I was going to write a book that would answer the question: Were free people of color citizens, or were they not? But it turns out, nobody, nobody can say, and that to me is a, a failure of um, you know a very prideful institution in this period, and just as tawny is, in that sense, offering a kind of cover, right? He doesn't admit, right, that everyone that's come before him has failed to figure this out. He acts like it's a fresh question and he's going to give us, right, the finality and predictability um, that law should offer. Um, and then the Maryland Court of Appeals says, no, thank you, as do other courts. And, um, he can't get any traction in Dred Scott. So, I don't, it, you didn't really ask a question, so I guess it's just a, a reflection in response to yours, but I thank you very much for it. And what I would suggest, because of time, is maybe we can take uh, two questions uh, and then um, have the response, and then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes so we can informally talk afterwards. Does that sound reasonable? All right, so we'll take one and then. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so there was a recent article published in the New York Times entitled uh, The 1619 Project, um, really asserting that um, America wasn't a democracy until black people fought for it. Um, so I was just wondering how your perceptions and um, as well as Hackett's history with citizenship not only um, expanded or um, possibly created a new identity as well. Um, thank you. And we'll just take one other together. Yeah, sorry. And I saw a hand over here. I'm going to ask it. Oh, okay. Um, I've been really interested in this presidency and the previous presidency about the interaction of religion with Americanness and what religion you, you practice or live by, how it can. Uh, impact people's perception of how American you are or are not. Um, and I, it's always been really interesting to me how it seems that the roots of that 
also come from how, um, how religion has always interacted with activism, um, particularly for the black community. So I wasn't surprised when you mentioned that his dad was a deacon and that he eventually followed in those footsteps, but I was interested to hear that he, it doesn't seem like he really stuck with that, like then he became a captain. Um, I would love to hear if in your research you found any more information on uh, you know, why he did or did not continue to be really active with the church, or maybe we just didn't hear about it, or if he chose to sort of move away from it, or just generally if, you know, sort of the role of the church in this really murky time. That's great, thanks. Can I, I've lost Professor Roberts. Oh, no. Am I good? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, the 1619 Project, uh, extraordinary, right? Really, really extraordinary. Uh, and uh, I'll say I didn't write anything for the 1619 Project, but but you can imagine what I might have written because I think the thrust of this um, book turns out to be um, precisely the way in which um, birthright citizenship, um, something uh, many, many Americans um, either don't even quite realize they benefit from or oftentimes take for granted, um, though um, less and less so every day, um, I think is absolutely one chapter, right, and in the, um, the role that black Americans have played in um, rendering this country as close to a democracy as it, it, as it has ever been. Um, you know, my, my friend and colleague, Cheryl and Eiffel, um, would say um, it's really not till Brown that we get to um, something like democracy in the United States. Um, so I think we could, we could play that game a little bit. Um, and I take Sherilyn's point um, that there is a long road right ahead of um, men like Hackett and uh, his family and his community out of the 14th Amendment moment and out of Reconstruction um, that is um, uneven and, and de in fact deeply troubled. Um, but I would still make the case that the 14th Amendment matters and it turns out that it matters um, far beyond um, the kinds of interests that former slaves held um, in the wake of um, civil war and emancipation. Um, in my view, birthright um, is one of the few safeguards against the unbridled, wholly unbridled uh, effects of racism, xenophobia, and more in this country. Um, in every generation in this country, um, there are the despised. And it turns out that the children of the despised are citizens of the United States, be they members of the Communist Party you know, or former slaves, the children of Chinese immigrants, women in the early 20th century who were denaturalized for marrying non-citizens, Japanese Americans, on and on, right? The despised after so-called 9-11, right? The children of Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, are citizens of the United States, I hope unassailably. Um, and that's powerful stuff in a country that has managed to infuse every other bit of official business that it has ever engaged in with racism and xenophobia. It's really exceptional. And so when we compare ourselves to other systems, other nations, other citizenship schemes, I think it's a false equivalence, not because racism and xenophobia don't exist in other places, but we should know better in this country than to be blithe um, about birthright, not because it's the whole answer, because it's part of it. And you know, um, I'm trying to connect to the, to the, the religion piece. Hackett, um, uh, Hackett does remain um, very active in the AME Church um, through his lifetime. I, I, I sort of give it its place here, but um, he will go on to be an important leader in this church, notorious, in fact, um, for his um, forcefulness, I guess I'll say, um, and his influence. Um, and um, he'll be at the heart of some schisms within black AME congregations in Baltimore City. Um, it, is a, it, is a, um, it, it is without a doubt in a city like Baltimore where anti-slavery societies, for example, are impossible, are seditious. 
um, and impossible to organize through um, the AME Church, among the other black churches, and there are many in Baltimore, is um, a critical um, site for the collective. It's back to this question, is Hackett unique? Not in the sense that he's part of these you know, congregations that are hundreds and thousands of people strong. Um, you know, but there will, there is a critique of Hackett and his, um, you know, um, assimilationist vision, right, for black Americans, even in his own lifetime. Um, uh, Hackett has a children and, and uh, marries a second time when his first wife passes away, he marries a woman who has a young daughter named Henrietta. And um, there's a, part of the reason I, this biography is so here is because there are a lot of things about Hackett I haven't told you, but one of the things is I have his will. And in his will, he um, very painstakingly provides for um, Henrietta. She's his stepdaughter, she's a young, she's a child, and um, his other children are adults. Um, and uh, he provides very carefully for her education and her training and very explicit instructions. And um, it's, a, it's, a very touching, um, it's a very touching document in that regard. And it turns out that um, Henrietta, um, in one sense, I think, went on to live a life that was very much in her stepfather's activist spirit. Um, and on the other hand, turned out, I think, to be a critic of his um, assimilationist um, leanings um, because she will become someone known to us as Henrietta Vinton Davis, um, one of the very important women leaders of the United um, Negro Improvement Association, the Garvey Movement. And in fact, she'll run UNIA when Garvey is um, jailed and then exiled. Um, so um, it is a is a complicated story, right? And I take you know Henrietta, in some sense, to be working right in a in a tradition, right, that she inherits and doing and making very different kinds of choices, right, about what it means for um, Black people to um, organize themselves and work toward human dignity. Um, in the 20th century, um, the Garvey movement would be um, as log logical um, and apparent a choice as would be, say, um, joining the NAACP. So I hope that goes a little way to your questions, but thank you. And um, if you can all join me in thanking very much <laughs> Professor Martha Jones.